Hello everyone, this is Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist Manager for BioRad in Canada. And in this segment of the Ultimate qPCR Experiment, I'll be discussing the data analysis. So here we have an example of a data set from three targets tested under two different treatment conditions. So as you can see here in column one, we have the target name, actin, HPRT, and DER5. Actin and HPRT would be our reference genes for normalization, and DER5 would be our, our gene of interest. We've interrogated these three targets in untreated and treated samples. Untreated S1 to 3 and treated S4 to 6. And we've tested these same six samples for each of the targets. The first step in the flow of data for qPCR data analysis is taking the mean CQ in column three of the individual technical replicates in a qPCR experiment. So each of the replic each of the biological cDNA samples or genomic DNA samples were tested in triplicate, typically in qPCR or in duplicate, and then the average CQ is noted for those technical triplicates or duplicates. So for actin, for the first six samples, we have these values, same thing for HPRT, and then we have values recovered for DER5. The next step in the flow of data in column four is to take the average CQ of our reference group. So in qPCR, it's important to understand that everything especially for gene expression analysis, is relative. So we have to assign a reference group, a reference biological group or treatment group. In this case, the reference group we're assigning is untreated. Typically, the reference group is the control group. So untreated, T equals zero, normal, mock infected. These would be examples of reference groups in the study set. And the average CQ is taken for the biological replicates, which is, which, which is what we have here, untreated S1, S2, S3, for our reference group, untreated. So that's what we've done here. The average of these three values for actin for untreated S1 to 3 is 28.74. We do the same thing for the other two targets. So HPRT untreated S1 to 3, the average is 28.5. And for DER5, S1 to 3, the average is 31.08. Then we have to perform the delta CQ. Now, again, this is very specific to gene expression analysis. And the delta CQ is the CQ from the reference average to the individual CQ values for the biological samples within a given target. So here, we're taking 28.74, which is the average of the triplicate untreated samples, and we subtract from 28.74 the individual CQ values for each of the untreated and treated samples. So of course, 28.74 minus 28.74 is zero. And as we see here, this is in column five, where we're subtracting column three from column four. So column four minus column three is zero for untreated S1. 28.74 minus 28.85 is negative 0.12, and so on and so forth. So these values are subtracted from each other to give our delta CQ values for actin, HPRT, same procedure is performed, 28.5 minus 29.00 is negative 0.5. 28.5 minus 28 is 0.5 and so on. We subtract all of the individual replicates in HPRT from the 28.5 reference average. And we do the same thing for DER5. So now we have established the delta CQ values for each of the targets from the reference average. The next step in the process is to raise the, refer the delta CQ values in column five that we've derived for each of the targets to the power to a base of two. 
Now, this base of 2 only applies if the reaction efficiency for each of the targets is at exactly 100%. So it's important to perform standard curve validation for each of the primer pairs for each target to assess reaction efficiency. And if reaction efficiency for the target after primer validation is not at 100%, then the base of 1 plus the reaction efficiency should be used. So if the reaction efficiency is 110%, then the base here should be 2.1. If it's 90%, it should be 1.9 to the power delta CQ. I've just made the assumption in these calculations to simplify the process that all targets were at 100% reaction efficiency, so the base of 2 is being applied here. So 2 to the power of 0 is 1. 2 to the power of negative 0.12 is 0.92. 2 to the power of negative 0.11 is 1.08, and so on and so forth. So these values are derived by simply raising the base of the, the delta CQ to a base of 2. And this gives us our relative quantities for actin, HPRT, and DER5. Now, qPCR, the accepted norms for qPCR, require that normalization be performed on a minimum of two to three reference genes. It's no longer acceptable to normalize qPCR data to only one reference gene. And, and the way normalization is done is by using the geometric mean stability of multiple reference genes, which is what column seven is derived. So here, we need to use actin for untreated S1. So we have a relative quantity of 1, and HPRT, which is our second reference gene, untreated S1, which has a value of 0.71. And these black lines denote that we're taking the geo mean, the geometric mean of 1 and 0.71, which gives us a value of 0.84. The reason why we can't use a direct mean of 1 and 0.71 is because these values are in the exponential space. They're raised to a base of 2. They're an exponential value, so we need to use the geometric mean to, to take the average of exponentially derived data. So we do the same thing for untreated S2, 0.92. And HPRT untreated S2, 1.41, which if we follow the red line, gives us a value of 1.14, the geometric mean. In Excel, you would use this geo mean open bracket, and then you can, you can click on the cells that would be associated with the two reference genes. For S3, same, pro, same procedure, 1.08, and then S3, for HPRT is 1, the geo mean of 1.08 and 1 is 1.04. And we do the same thing for the treated samples for both actin and HPRT, which are these values here, the geo mean. So now we've, de we've developed a normalization factor. So we've derived a normalization factor, which is, this, which is the mean stability of our two reference genes. The next step in the process is to actually use this normalization factor to normalize our expression data. So remember, we've already determined for DER5 the relative quantity, 2 to the power of the delta CQ for untreated and treated, and now we have the mean stability of both actin and HPRT, again, for untreated and treated. So for normalization, it's a simple process of dividing the normalization factor for our two reference genes by the relative quantity for our gene of interest. So 0.88 for DER5 for untreated S1 divided by 0.84 is 1.05. For untreated S2, it would be 1.05 divided by 1.14, which is 0.92. And for untreated S3, 1.08 divided by 1.04, which is 1.04. And the same procedure is done for the treated sample. So 0.34 divided by 1.23 is 
is 0.27 and so on. So now we have our normalized results for DER5, for untreated, and the treated samples. And it makes sense actually that the treated samples are decreasing in, in terms of normalized expression versus the untreated samples, because if we go back to the raw CQ values, we see actually that the raw CQ values are approximately average 31.08 for untreated, and the treated CQ values go up to about one CQ more, 32 point approximately two or three perhaps, which is about one CQ later, which would indicate a decrease in normalized expression. So we're decreasing in our normalized expression between the untreated and the treated samples by approximately a factor of two. Okay, the next step in the process <clears throat> requires um, for the bar chart, if you're planning on plotting these data on a bar chart, we now need to take the mean of our untreated and our treated samples, except again, bear in mind, all of these calculations that we did when we took the relative quantity and the, and the normalization factor, the geo mean of actin and HPRT, all of these values are still in the exponential space. So, which means that our normalized expression is also still in the exponential space. So we have to use a, the geo mean to calculate the mean of our individual replicates for uh, after normalization for untreated versus treated. So the geo mean of 1.05, 0.92, and 1.04 is one. The geo mean of these three values for, for the uh, treated samples is 0.43. So these values are plotted typically on a bar chart or a scatter, scatter plot. Now, I'm going to show you the next slide, which will encompass all of the data from column 8 to column 15 with the resulting bar chart to depict how the data is presented. So that's here. So we can see now we're plotting one for our untreated samples and 0.43 for the treatment group on the bar chart. So this is how the data is re represented, where we have the biological group, which would be the, tr the treatment groups and normalized fold expression on the y-axis, which is the geomean uh, after we average, using geometric mean, our untreated and our treated samples, which is the values here. The error bars also need to be applied in the exponential space, because remember, these bars are still in the exponential space. So in order to calculate the error bars, what we typically do is we log transform our exponentially derived data using a base of two. So the log base two transformation of 1.05, 1.05, log base two of 1.05 is 0 0.07. Log base two of 0.92 is negative 0.12 and so on. So we log transform our data for the untreated and the treated samples. And then we can perform because now we're back into the linear space. And what we can do after log transformation is we can take the direct mean and average uh, mean and standard deviation of these values. We don't need to use geo mean at this stage. So the mean of our untreated samples is zero and the mean of our treatment samples is negative 1.21. Now, in fact, what we did here in column 11, as opposed to taking the, the direct mean of these three, was we just converted one to log base two and 0.43 to log base two, but the results would be the same. 
So after we've taken the mean of the log transform data, then we can also take the standard deviation. So the standard deviation of these three values for untreated is 0.11, the standard deviation of these three values is 0.73, and the standard error of the mean is simply the standard deviation divided by the square root of the n number, and for untreated and treated, the n number is 1, 2, 3. So three biological replicates for untreated and three for treated. So 0.11 divided by the square root of 3 is 0.06, and 0.73 divided by the square root of 3 is 0.42. So now we have our standard error of the mean data. So our error bars, therefore, the positive portion of the error bar for the treated samples from, from where the average ends until the top part of the error bar would be negative 1.21 plus or minus, because we're using standard error of the mean here, negative 1.21 plus or minus 0.42, but we have to raise those values. The error bars are calculated by raising the calculated standard error, uh, standard error of the mean to the base of two. So the upper portion of the error bar here would be negative 1.21 plus 0.42 raised to the power of two. So two to the power of of negative 1.21 plus 0.42 is this upper portion of the error bar. Two to the power of negative 1.21 minus 0.42 is the lower portion of the error bar. And we do the same thing for the untreated samples. Two to the power of zero plus 0.06 would be this upper part of the error bar, and 2 to the power of 0 minus 0 0.06 would be the lower part of the error bar. And that's why the error bars are actually skewed and not perfectly symmetrical around the mean, because we're, we're actually presenting the error bars in the same exponential space as the averages that were calculated in that space as well. For statistical analysis, it's important to, to use the log transform data. So when, when we perform um, parametric t-tests or ANOVA tests, never use the normalized expression data that's in the exponential space. Use the, we need to log transform the normalized expression values first, as we see in column 9, and then from these values we can perform all the statistical tests to assess the statistical significance between our two groups. Just one point of notation would be the purpose of taking the average for the untreated samples or your reference group is to assure that your reference group, which is your typically the control group, gives you a value of one when you look at normalized expression. Because remember, everything's relative to our reference group, and the reference group obviously should be relative to itself, and anything relative to itself should be a value of one. So this is very convenient because by taking the average, it permits us not only to achieve the value of one for our reference group, which is the untreated samples, but it also permits us, because we're subtracting the individual samples in our reference group from the average, it also permits us to obtain a standard deviation and standard error of the mean for the reference group.